Welcome to The Big Picture. I'm Phil Arno. I call this show The Big Picture because, well, it's easy in this life to get distracted with the little things, details that take you away from what is really important. Any magician will tell you that their trick is to get you to look at something that doesn't really matter so that they can hide the trick. Politicians, let's face it, make great magicians. I think they went to the same sleight of hand school someplace. That shouldn't really surprise you, right? We all know that our elected officials show us one thing, happily smiling while doing something important behind the scenes, the stuff they would never want you to see. Hey, no offense, some of my best friends are politicians. That's just the way it is. If they told you what they were really doing or why, they might get thrown out of office or into jail, right? On this big picture, I'm going to cover a couple of subjects that we hear about all the time, especially from government leaders. But what we hear is only what the powers that be want you to hear. The two examples I want to use today, briefly, because these subjects can be quite complicated, are climate change and gun control. You may be sick of these things. You may get your blood pressure up just listening. I can assure you, though, what you will hear in the next half hour is not something you have or will hear from most sources anywhere else, no matter where you look. So if you have an open mind and an appreciation for common sense, then stay tuned. Now first, climate change, or as it's been called in the past, global cooling, global warming, or just plain old, the death of everyone, right? Well, a while back, a long time ago in fact, I was working for one of the other TV stations in town, and the subject of global warming became, no pun intended, uh, a hot topic. So I headed to the National Weather Service at the Buffalo Airport. I sat down with the head of the Weather Service at the time, a veteran of several decades of predicting and studying the weather. And I was all set to do a story about how horrible this global warming thing was. My conversation, though, was an eye-opener. You see, this weather guy was just that. He wasn't getting any grant money to do a report on what a disaster we were having. He wasn't being paid to scare the daylights out of the public. He really didn't have an agenda at all. And the first thing he told me was, look, weather is one thing. Climate is something entirely different, and don't get the two confused. Climate goes in cycles, long periods. Weather is short term. And then he explained something to me that has stuck with me over the years more than anything else. He said, we, the Weather Service, have been keeping records since the 1870s or so, and we have information going back a lot further. What we know for sure is that the sun, specifically sunspots, have a direct influence on our climate patterns, and that sun activity tends to go in 30 or 40 year cycles. For instance, from the 1880s to 1910 or 1915, in this country anyway, it was cool and damp. In the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, it was hot and dry. In fact, most of our record temperatures, high temperatures in this country, are still in the 1930s Dust Bowl era. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, it was cold and wet. <laughs> when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s, winter seemed like one great big snowstorm. Think of the blizzard of 77 and, and the, the coming ice age that everybody worried about back then. Then it started to warm up. The 80s, 90s, and early 2000s got hot. But recently, since maybe 2010, global temperatures really haven't increased all that much. Some readings have changed, but what isn't said is that the locations where they take those readings in many instances have changed, which can account for some warmer, that is different, 
readings. The type of instruments have also evolved, so conditions can't quite be compared. You won't hear that about the different ways they collect things and possibly data having an effect on the numbers, that you're not going to hear the little details like that. No, CO2, that's going to be the problem. And coincidentally, that's tied to everything we do. Our cars, our furnaces, hell, even our steak dinners. So we're bad people because we enjoy those aspects of our lives. Well, if we do, then we're killing polar bears or something like that. But CO2, is that really a cause of warming? We hear about it every day. Al Gore, who has several homes, travels in limousines and on private jets, he tells us we have to cut back. CO2 is bad, very bad. Well, listen to this video very, very closely. Professor Ian Clark is a leading Arctic paleoclimatologist who looks back into the Earth's temperature record hundreds of thousands of years. When we look at uh, climate on long scales, we're looking for geological material that actually records climate. If we're to take an ice sample, for example, we use isotopes to reconstruct temperature, but the atmosphere that's imprisoned in that ice, we liberate, and then we look at the CO2 content. Professor Clark and others have indeed discovered a link between carbon dioxide and temperature. But the link is the wrong way round. So here we're looking at the ice core record from Vostok. And in the red, we see temperature going up from early time to later time at a very key interval when we came out of a glaciation. And we see the temperature going up. And then we see the CO2 coming up. CO2 lags behind that increase. It's got an 800-year lag. So temperature is leading CO2 by 800 years. There have now been several major ice core surveys. Every one of them shows the same thing. The temperature rises or falls, and then after a few hundred years, carbon dioxide follows. So obviously, carbon dioxide is not the cause of that warming. In fact, we can say that the warming produced the increase in carbon dioxide. CO2 clearly cannot be causing temperature changes. It's a product of temperature. It's following temperature changes. The ice core record goes to the very heart of the problem we have here. They said, if the CO2 increases in the atmosphere as a greenhouse gas, then the temperature will go up. But the ice core record shows exactly the opposite. So the fundamental assumption the most fundamental assumption of the whole theory of, of climate change due to humans is, is shown to be wrong. I bet you haven't heard that before. Is it true? Professor Clark is an experienced scientist, highly respected. If you don't believe him, maybe try to find some unbiased source, if that's possible, and do your own research. So if CO2 isn't the culprit, all the experts tell us it is. Then what's the next question? What does drive climate change? Well, that brings me back to the National Weather Service conversation. Funny how that guy really nailed it. In 1991, senior scientists at the Danish Meteorological Institute decided to compile a record of sunspots in the 20th century and compare it with the temperature record. What they found was an incredibly close correlation between what the sun was doing and changes in temperature on Earth. Solar activity, they found, rose sharply to around 1940, fell back until the 1970s, and then started to rise again. When we saw this um, correlation between the temperature and solar activity and or sunspot cycle lengths, then uh, people said to us, OK, it can be just a coincidence. So how can we prove that it's not just a coincidence? Well, one obvious thing is to have a longer time series or different time series. Then we went back in time. 
So Professor Fries Christiansen and his colleagues gathered together astronomical records for the past 400 years in order to compare sunspot activity against temperature variation. Once again, they found that variations in solar activity were intimately linked to temperature change on Earth. It was the sun, it seemed, not carbon dioxide or anything else that was driving changes in the climate. The sun affects the Earth directly when it sends down heat. But scientists have now established that the sun also affects us indirectly by regulating the formation of clouds. In fact, the sun affects the Earth in so many ways that perhaps it shouldn't surprise us that variations in solar activity correspond so closely with the Earth's changing climate. If you had X-ray eyes, what appears as a nice, friendly, yellow ball would appear like a raging tiger. The sun is an incredibly violent beast and it's throwing out great puffs of gas and endless solar wind that's forever rushing past the earth. We're in a certain sense inside the atmosphere of the sun. The intensity of its magnetic field more than doubled during the 20th century. In 2005, astrophysicists from Harvard University published the following graph in the official journal of the American Geophysical Union. The blue line represents temperature change in the Arctic over the past 100 years. And here is the rise in carbon dioxide over the same period. The two are not obviously connected. But now look again at the temperature record and at this red line, which depicts variations in solar activity over the past century as recorded independently by scientists from NASA and America's National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Solar activity over the last hundred years, over the last several hundred years, correlates very nicely on a decadal basis with sea ice and Arctic temperatures. For many scientists, the conclusion is inescapable. The sun is driving climate change. CO2 is irrelevant. But why, if this is so, are we bombarded day after day with news items about man-made global warming? Why do so many people in the media and elsewhere regard it as an undisputed fact? To understand the power of global warming theory, we must tell the story of how it came about. Patrick Moore is considered one of the foremost environmentalists of his generation. He is co-founder of Greenpeace. The shift to climate being a major focal point came about for two very distinct reasons. The first reason was because by the mid-80s, a majority of people now agreed with all of the reasonable things we in the environmental movement were saying they should do. Now, when a majority of people agree with you, it's pretty hard to remain confrontational with them. And so the only way to, to, to remain anti-establishment was to adopt ever more extreme positions. When I left Greenpeace, it was in the midst of them adopting a campaign to ban chlorine worldwide. Like I said, you guys, this is one of the elements in the periodic table, you know. I mean, I'm not sure if that's in our jurisdiction to be banning a whole element. Destroying the, wall were soon the other reason that environmental extremism emerged was because world communism failed, the wall came down, and a lot of peaceniks and political activists moved into the environmental movement, bringing their neo-Marxism with them, and learned to use green language in a very clever way to cloak agendas that actually have more to do with anti-capitalism and anti-globalization than they do anything with ecology or science. The left have been slightly uh, disoriented uh, by the manifest failure of socialism and indeed even more so of communism as, as it was tried out. And therefore, they still remain as anti-capitalist as they were, but they have to find a new guise for their anti-capitalism. And it was a kind of uh, amazing alliance from uh, Margaret Thatcher on the right through to very left-wing anti-capitalist environmentalists that created this kind of momentum behind a loony idea. 
By the early 1990s, man-made global warming was no longer an eccentric theory about climate. It was a full-blown political campaign, attracting media attention and, as a result, more government funding. Prior to Bush the Elder, I think the level of funding for climate and climate-related sciences was somewhere around the order of $170 million a year, which was reasonable for the size of the field. It jumped to $2 billion a year, more than a factor of 10. And uh, yeah, that changed a lot. I mean, that's a lot of jobs. A lot of jobs. It brought a lot of new people into it who otherwise were not interested. So you developed whole cadres of people whose only interest in the field was that there was global warming. If I wanted to do research on, shall we say, the squirrels of Sussex, what I would do, and this is any time from 1990 onwards, I would write my grant application saying, I want to investigate the nut gathering behavior of squirrels with special reference to the effects of global warming. And that way I get my money. If I forget to mention global warming, I might not get the money. We're all competing for funds. And uh, if your field is the focus of concern, you have that much less work rationalizing why your field should be funded. So there you have it, climate change. If you're sick of hearing that term, as sick as I am, now you have a good argument for anybody who comes around trying to scare you into getting rid of your car, boycotting meat, tossing your furnace or your gas stove, or most of all, voting for the next politician that says he or she is gonna help you save the earth by raising your taxes, limiting your life choices, or deciding for you what is best for your life and your family Hey folks, in my opinion, we're being lied to. We're being manipulated for purposes that are not in our best interest. The next time you hear some blowhard mention how much we have to fear from climate change, think of that person as either a dupe who swallowed the Kool-Aid, or worse, a manipulator who's trying to steal your freedom. Again, that's just my opinion. When we come back, we'll look into some things you probably haven't heard about gun control. Stay tuned. Welcome back to The Big Picture. I have to admit, I've had a permit to carry a firearm for over 40 years. Now, I've seen a lot of things in my career in news. I've done stories on what can happen when guns are misused. I've seen occasions when guns save innocent lives. You hear a lot of negative things about guns. And to be honest, guns do get used to hurt innocent people in this world far too much. What we don't hear, because it doesn't fit the approved storyline, is that Far more often, guns prevent bad people from hurting innocent people hundreds of thousands of times a year. Guns stop crime from being committed most of the time without a shot being fired. That's right. According to the FBI's annual Unified Crime Report and other sources, including the CDC, Americans stop bad guys from committing a crime just by showing the presence of a defensive handgun, countless times a day. In fact, a study commissioned by President Obama after the Sandy Hook school shooting, in that study, the CDC found that as many as three million crimes were prevented in 2012 alone by citizens with legal firearms. Well, what about mass shootings? What about school shootings? Those horrible, those horrible things in our society, we have to do something, right? Well, think about this. A study was done showing that between 1950 
and 2016, 98% of all mass shootings in this country were done in what we call gun-free zones, places where the shooter could be sure that he or she would not be bothered by an armed citizen. Now think about the simple logic of gun control. Laws restricting guns are basically going to prevent people who obey the law from owning a gun. People who are intent on breaking the law, well, gun laws aren't going to prevent them from having a gun. So anyone who has any understanding of logic, politicians may be excused right now, must admit that gun laws that prevent citizens who do not have a mental problem, are not repeat felons, are willing to undergo the training, go through the process and comply with all the rules, these laws make no sense. In fact, they cause honest people to be at risk. And speaking of honest people being at risk, when a know-it-all government official says that no one needs 10 bullets to kill a deer, and by implication, no one needs 10 bullets to defend themselves, we should ask that official, how many bullets does your bodyguard have in that Glock 17? 15? 18? If, in fact, you count the number of bodyguards, and you multiply the number of bullets by each guard, I'll bet there's a whole bunch more than 10 bullets surrounding, say, a given female governor who has pushed more gun restrictions on us than any governor in any state in the entire country. Lucky us. And if you want to think about what makes sense, take a look at this video by an ex-police officer and one of the most res respected gun experts in the entire country regarding the logic of bureaucrats restricting magazine capacity. We're going to talk today about one particular group of people whom the 10-round magazine limits have a, a disparate impact upon, and that would be the handicapped, the physically challenged. Now, it's kind of appalling that so many of the prohibitionists who want to limit your ability to defend yourselves say they're doing it out of compassion. Well, let's have a little bit of compassion for the elderly, the halt, and the lame in our community. We're told if there's a mass murder attempt that we should run, hide, fight. In that order. First run. Can't run away? Well, hide. If that fails, then and only then, fight. And if the prohibitionists have their way, my question would be, fight with what? Tell me how you run away when you're in a wheelchair. Tell me how you run away on a cane, on a walker, or hobbling with sciatica or a bad knee on a given day, or any of us who are in perfect health today might have a broken leg tomorrow that puts us in a walking cast or perhaps one of those wheelchairs. Tell me how someone in a wheelchair crawls under a desk, how someone in a wheelchair can lock themselves in a broom closet to hide. I think we need to reverse the paradigm, and for them, the response will have to be fight and make the homicidal criminal run and hide if he's still capable of doing so. Now, the, the prohibitionists, and believe me, I've had this argument with them in federal courts, will tell you, oh, if you think you need more bullets, just carry more spare magazines. Talk to anyone who is wheelchair bound. It's all they can do in that enclosed space to find a place where they can carry a handgun at all. They've also got to have a cell phone, et cetera, et cetera. They can't put them on the back of their, behind their belt like you or I might, because leaning back in that chair, a person who is paralyzed can't feel if there's nerve pressure causing damage, causing bed sores or equivalent, until it's too late to prevent those injuries. Where are they going to carry the spare ammunition? How do we ask the person crippled by arthritis to do a speed reload? Well, case in point, you want an arthritic hand, here's one now. Notice how the fingers twist. Notice how the, the range of movement gets changed. I found my, it's taking me twice as long to reload a semi-automatic pistol as it used to. Now, if it's gonna take, say, three, four seconds or more to, to reload that pistol, 
If the pistol had, I stand what we call today the standard capacity magazine, the higher capacities that those guns were designed for. The next shot is going to take place in a quarter second if it's needed. The disparate impact upon the handicap is huge with those magazine limits. That's something I think we all need to take into consideration and remind those who are on the other side that if they're so compassionate, if they want to save lives, they ought to have a little bit of concern for the most vulnerable potential victims we have in our society, the handicapped and the physically challenged. Now, Mossad is not a nut. He is a well-spoken, well-thought-out expert with years of real-world experience on the streets. Compare that with Kathy Hochul or some of our other quote-unquote leaders that we put in control of our freedoms. People who have never even held a firearm or have they been victimized, helpless in, in their homes or on the street, waiting the three to five minutes or more for a police officer to respond if they were lucky enough to call for help. Just a final thought, folks. The police are not there to prevent a crime from happening. Ask any cop on the road. They are there to show up after you have been robbed or injured or worse. They're there to do a report and hopefully catch whomever it was that injured you. That's the real world. Unless the police happen to be in the right place at the right time, we're on our own when it comes to being victimized. And one other element, criminals don't want to mess with armed citizens, guaranteed. Now, thanks for watching this big picture. I hope it's made sense to you, and if you have a differing point of opinion on any of this, let me know. We'll make it part of the discussion in the future. Again, thanks for watching WBBZ, and we'll see you next time on The Big Picture.